Hello, everybody, and welcome to part two of our series. And before we get started, just a couple of heads up. Uh, this is the first time we've been out kind of reshooting everything. We haven't had these big cameras dusted off in forever. So, of course, we're running into a couple of technical issues and all that kind of aggravation. This particular video is a reshoot. We actually did this after we finished the series because the first time out, there were a couple of inconsistencies I didn't like. Uh, there were a couple of bad things. I just, it, bleh, we had some audio issues. So this is a reshoot. So as we get into the next couple of videos, if some things seem out of sync or out of order or not exactly contiguous, that's why we're reshooting. But uh, it's all for the better quality of the video. So... For part two, now you guys have already seen how the bird cage is made, and so now you're going to be after making one of these. This is going to be your bird cage turkey foot poker. It's called a turkey foot poker because of this guy right here. It's an older design, uh, colonial in nature, most of the ones that I've seen it, at least, has our nice bird cage handle. So in this video, we're going to be doing uh, two things specifically. We're going to be showing you how to make the hook on the end of the birdcage and then how to make the front end of this poker. Now, a couple of things that are a little bit different than the original video that we shot. If you guys take a look, focus you joker, focus. Nope, okay. If you guys can see that, you can see that the rods actually, here, give me some light on there. There we go. You can see that the rods all come together to form the hook itself. So this is the first style that we're going to do. Um, now, because we're using that extra material there to do that, originally we did these in six inches. In the reshoot, I extended the length of the initial rods to seven inches to give us a little bit more beef uh, to play with while it's up here. There'll be another technique we'll use later, but for this instance, if you're going to do it this way, uh, seven inches on those rods at a quarter of an inch. Now, uh, this is not an exceedingly difficult piece to do. The only real difficult thing is getting the forge welds in there and getting this hammered out. The reason that I don't prefer doing my hooks this way or bringing these rods together is because as you're drawing this stuff out, those welds in there have a tendency to slip if you really get aggressive with it. So you end up getting some tearing, especially on the end there. So you have to be extra careful, and it takes a lot of patience to get this right. And for me, it still really doesn't look as good as something that's got a solid piece up there. And you'll see what I mean in the next video. Um, but I'm going to show you this technique because it is traditional. It's, it's very common in colonial stuff, and uh, it's neat to watch at the very least. So let's get started. So picking up where the last video had left off, uh, I've got my bundle of four rods here. This is quarter-inch hot rolled round, seven inches long. I will fuse these ends together. Uh, I will actually make one lip on this end, and then we'll fuse about two inches on this end. Um, once that is done, we will come in with our 27, 28 inch, 3 8 rod here. I mean, pick 27, 28, you'll be good either way. Uh, and then we will fuse this piece to here, uh, and then we can go about making our poker. So let me take a heat on both of these, and we'll go to work. I'm going to go ahead and fuse this one first. We've got a good heat, a little bit of tap. Now, you, you guys notice I have got the exposure crank way down on the camera. That's hopefully so you can see more of how the weld is put together and it's not blowing the camera out. And just like that, we have our first weld right there. We're good to go. I'm going to flip it around and do this back end. Now, of course, on this side, we did want the taper right here because we're going to attach it to the handle here. But on this back side, uh, it, we're going to end up actually fusing this together to make our hook. So flipping it around now. We've got a good heat. And I'm going to weld up about two inches. Now, again, I'm not pulling the taper on this bad boy yet. I just wanted to get this stuck together and squared just a little bit. And now we're going to put this on our uh, handle, and then we can go to work on this end. Not too bad, not too shabby. And uh, once, you, uh, once you get quick with the forge weld, that'll be all that it is. Practice, practice, practice. 
Okay, guys, so I've already got our handle and our shank wired up. The pieces are ready to be fused together. And again, this is where you're going to have to practice a little bit of caution. Forge welding is a bit of a pain in the butt. It requires you to know what colors you're looking for. You're looking for sparks. It's something that you're simply going to have to practice to get good at. Of course, the biggest issue being here, if you overheat it, you turn your hard work into a puddle of liquid magma. It's a bad deal. So, I would stress to you, as you're doing this, be careful on sneaking up on that heat. Go slow. Don't bury it in the coals. You want to be looking at it the whole time so you can see when that surface of that metal goes glassy. That's usually the first indication of the forge welding. If you bury it in those coals, uh, you go over to light a cigarette or you fart at an inopportune time, you're going to end up with a melted piece of work and that's no good. So be careful. All right, we've got a good heat. Tappy tap, tap, tap. Again, make sure and go for the lips first. Don't you know in any fight, you always go for the lips first. And that's what we're doing here. Again, notice I'm not killing it. Now, I didn't get a good fusion right there on that one. So what I'll do is come back, reflux it, and take one more heat and seal that up. And then bring everything down to a taper. Straighten everything up. It looks like we've got a good situation. Everything is nice and fused in. And now we can get into making our hook. Not too shabby if I do say so myself. So, excelente primo good. We now have our handle attached to our shank. Everything sealed up pretty nicely. Now we can go back here and start working on our hook. Now, for the hook, I need about five inches of taper. Uh, I measured this. I took a piece of wire and went around the mandrel that I'm going to use. Of course, you can do this over the horn of the anvil. Just normally when we're here in the shop, what we try to do is we try to use mandrels because that keeps the curls consistent. So, again, now when I'm pulling this out, I fuse this together, but it's still got a little bit of meh to it. So, on this first work, I'm actually going to bring it up to the welding heat again just to make sure we've got everything nice and fused. Doesn't hurt anything, and it keeps us from having a possible separation, which is always an issue uh, with these guys. That's the only aggravation in here, is that as you're drawing this out, it puts a lot of stress on those shear lines. If you're not careful, it will actually pop, and you'll have a cold shut or split in the piece. So, it's one of the reasons I don't particularly like this technique. And you can see that pulled out pretty nice. You can still see, see a little bit of a seam, but that tip hasn't split, which is very, very common when you're doing this. So it's, uh, it's looking pretty darn good. We'll take another heat, continue to draw this out. Like I said, we've got to have about two more inches on that before we're ready to go. Here we come with heat number two. Good second heat. Let's go for number three.
All right, let's see where we are. We still need about three quarters of an inch. Uh, I'm going to come back and get a little bit more meat from down there. Well, if you noticed on this last one, I actually had that tip a little hot. It's because I saw some separation in there, so I kind of did a quick forge weld on that just to kind of keep it all together. It's going to happen. Uh, almost inevitably, you're going to have some separation on that tip. So sometimes you have to be very careful, get just the right amount of heat to tack all that together. Now, as we draw this thing out, there's a couple things you need to keep in mind. Uh, one of them is the fact that you're drawing this thing out thinner and thinner, which means it heats faster and faster. So again, pay attention to your heat. This thing's getting thinner. And if you're using an electric blower, it only takes a moment for you to look away, talk, get a drink or something, and it's going to melt it. So remember, thinner steel means greater risk for disaster. Alright, I think that's going to do it for us. I don't want this to be square, so I'm going to round it. I'm going to knock the edges off of it now. Okay, now, if you noticed, even when I was doing that, these are wanting to separate a little bit right there. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to put a little bit of bend right there. I'm going to flux this and I want to fuse those guys. I'm just going to have from here down to be the rods I want to twist, but I'm going to make that stick together. Tappy tap tap. All right, that looks like it is okay. And so before our heat completely wears off, I'm going to bend this over here. I'm going to keep that straight. There we go. And you can see what we've got here. And now we're ready to go to our mandrel and bend that around our mandrel. We have a good heat, so I'm going to use this. Now, if I didn't get enough length, which you can see I'm a little short right there, that's okay because I can tighten this in using the top with little to no problem. Can even it out and get a good looking piece. But what I am going to do is I'm going to flatten this out I'm come back in with a pair of pliers. I'm going to give that a little bit of a pigtail and then reset it and then we'll be good to go. Now the rat tail or the pigtail is not only just a decorative piece. Uh, you see how sharp that joker is? It will, uh, it will effectively test your tenderloin if you understand what I'm saying. So having that little turn right there uh, prevents you from uh, hooking yourself in the nethers. So that helps a lot. But you can see it really does change where our hook closes. So again, another heat, an adjustment on the mandrel here, and we're good to go. Another good heat. And I try let, not letting my OCD interfere, and you can see we have a nice, nice hook now. So now it is time to make our twist. So now with the twist, we of course are going to go in little, 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 little. You know, normally I would edit that out, but since I'm too lazy at this point, we're going to leave it in. Normally what would happen is we would go over to the vise, and um, that's exactly what we're going to do. Man, it's been a long day. We are absolutely going to go over to the vise. We're going to clamp in on the bottom, and we're going to use an adjustable bending wrench or twisting wrench uh, on the top here. Now this is where the, kind of the aggravation of this particular style is because those rods up top aren't necessarily have a, a solid stop spot. So they're going to have a tendency to want to tear a little bit. Um, and again, it can be managed. It's just a pain in the behunkus. But at any rate, whether you're doing it this way or the way we're going to look at it in the next video, the main thing you need for all this is that it, there's a nice even heat on all four rods. These four rods are not connected. That means that heat's not going to transfer through them. So when you are putting this in the fire, you've got to rotisserize. Make sure and roll this thing over back and forth. Look at the color of your rods. Make sure they're all the same color, not only in the center, but also all the way down. 
The secret to a good twist of any flavor is even heat. Here we come into the vise. I'm going to catch it about a half inch down. Here are my twisting bar. And let's go. You want to tighten it to it twist, but you don't want to stretch those bars. And it's going to have a tendency to kind of get all out of whack. So what I normally do is after I twist, I go back into the vise and I let my vise help straighten this thing out. This helps tremendously before you untwist because you need it straight and you want it super, super even. And that's not too bad right there. I'm going to get it one more time though. <clears throat> Take that. So now the bars are wrapped a little bit more and they're actually transfer heat more effectively. It's going to go back into the fire. I'm going to reheat and then we're going to back this bad boy off and open it up into our bird cage. But again, beforehand, make sure everything is as straight and lined up as possible. If this thing is off when you back it out, you're going to have problems. Good even heat, lock it in our vise, and now we're going to back it off. Open it up, and when you open it up, make sure and stop so that the flats are aligned on the bar. There will be the need for a lot of tapping. But man, looky there, that's not too terrible bad. I got one little place right there. Probably need to adjust a little scooch right there. And those bars are pretty freaking even. I can close that setup right there just a little bit. Let me grab my pliers. So if you need to close these, again, just pull those two together like that. Just some minor adjustments. And there you go. Not too terrible shabby. Now do yourself a favor and do not just drop this in the quench barrel. Uh, if this thing is still super hot and you drop it in the quench, those rods will twist at a different rate and it will pull it all out of alignment. The best thing you can do after you're done twisting it and backing it off, sit it out and let it cool down naturally. Um, many a time has there been a young fellow that has dropped this in the water and have it come out looking like it's a stroke victim. So don't do that. Let it cool down and you're good to go. But let's take a close look at it. So all in all, this is a pretty clean piece. Uh, we've got our nice evenly spaced uh, spirals here. These pieces come up and they form very well into the hook. This area right here, though, let me tell you, is normally a pain in the butt. If you notice, I put that end in the vise and then use this end to twist it with. That's also a trick you need to pay attention to. Because if you were to do it the opposite way, these guys have a tendency to come apart and it's not good. It's also very difficult to get those tacked in and have them stay where they need to be. It's tough. It can be done. Uh, I'm just not very good at it, and therefore I'd advise you trying it, but uh, don't get your hopes up. But all in all, that is a good-looking basket handle there. Fits the hand nicely. Good even hook there with a little pigtail. Not a bad piece at all. So now that we're done with that, we can get on to the front end of the business end of this poker and make our turkey foot. Now, before I actually get into making the front end of the poker, uh, one thing I want to point out is that this particular piece of rod is fresh off the shelf. It has nice square edges, and that is something that you don't want. Good work is stuff that has been worked all over. So take the time to break those edges. Put it on the anvil, beat up those edges. Don't let there be a factory line on there. And that is something that really separates what's meh work from good work. You know, as a professional, if I go by somebody's table and I'm looking, whenever I see a factory edge, pff, I'm done. I, no offense, I'm done. There's a factory edge on there that doesn't need to be there. If you've got three-quarters factory and then one little part over here that you forged, 
what are you doing? The entire idea behind this stuff is to make good quality hand forged stuff. Now, I'll be able to tell if it's a modern piece, but if you make me look, you have my respect. And I cannot tell from 10 feet. If it's hammered edges, I have to look because that said, hmm, that whole thing's worked. It might be a very old piece. Nope, nope. It's not a very old piece. It's just a high quality modern one. Break those edges. So now we're ready to make the front end of our poker, and it's relatively simple. What we'll do is we'll take this, we'll draw it down to a nice taper, and then we're going to fold it back over onto itself. Now, it has a very particular name, but unfortunately, if I named it, I believe YouTube would, would, uh, would actually catch it. So there is a particular name for a well that folds back over onto itself. Uh, it's the British name for cigarette. Uh, anyway, it's a type of forge weld that we're going to use to make the two ends of our poker. So taper on the front, fold over, and then that knuckle where we fold it over, we're going to pull that into a point as well. It's a pretty neat little deal. So take a heat, and I'll pull that straight out. Now you don't need a super long or super pointy taper for this, so don't go crazy. Think of it more as a spur. Now, if you look close, you see that little hanging piece of crud right there? That was a piece that I left on there intentionally. That was probably something from the cutting process. Sometimes if you roll that over, you're going to get a coal shut right there you're going to have a lot of problem with fine tips like that. If you get good at what you're doing, if you can bring just that tip up to welding heat, you can fuse all that stuff together and not have a problem. Uh, but again, just be aware that's one of those little tricks that will help you tremendously. Super quick tap. And problem solved. All right, so now I'm going to come take another heat, and about, I'm going to say about two and a half, three inches in, I'm going to fold this back over onto itself. Now, pay attention to which side that your handle is facing down, because what you're going to want to do is when you bend this, you want to bend it down in line with the hook of your handle. If you don't do this, then at some later point, you're going to have to make a twist in the shank to line it back up and pretend like that's what you meant to do all along. Ask me how I know. In about two and a half, three inches, fold it over the edge of the anvil, bring it back onto itself. Leave a little gap in there so that you can get your flux down in there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fuse about an inch of this guy together, and then we're going to draw this out into a point. Got a good strong heat. And something like this is what you want to end up with. So now what we'll do, we'll take one more heat, and we're going to come over here to the horn of our anvil. And over the horn, we're going to roll this guy down, and at the same time pull this one up. It's going to be pretty, a pretty cool little S shape. It's pretty freaking awesome. All right, here we go. See how that spur begins to lift? And then hopefully, I've got enough purchase to get under right up under here. And you're going to have to play with this just a little bit because it's going to get all kind of do wonkus. But that's okay.
Now, if you saw that, it popped up right there. That well didn't quite take, so I'm going to hit it one more time with the 20 Mule Train Fusion Cocaine, seal that up, and then do just a little bit more shaping, and I think she's ready to go. Got ourselves a good heat. Tappy tap tap. And that is what I am looking for. Ladies and gentlemen, check that bad boy out right there. There is your turkey foots poker. Not too shabby. Now, you can get real aggressive with that curve because it pokes and it pulls. Uh, and you can do it either way you want to. But I usually leave it right there. It's got that cool look to it. Like a pew pew, like lasers. It's awesome. Okay, guys, and so what we've ended up with is a really nice poker. Now, of course, you can embellish this. You can add some twists in there, but you get the idea. Now, if you use the full 28 inches, I mean, this makes this a good, it's probably a good 30, 34 inch poker there, maybe a little bit shorter than that. But this joker's got some reach. Again, if you're making this for a client, you need to kind of make it to the client. Some of the fire tools are very small. Uh, this one, I mean, Kids got to run a good ways for you. You know, they're out of range. So an awesome piece. Super basic, but it's got a fancy handle to it. So these are good, good pieces. If you can pull one of these off consistently, you really know what you're doing. So excellent, a primo good. I am pretty stoked with this. Guys, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Um, we've got more coming again. Forgive me if there's a couple of incongruities, incontinuities and other such things in the course of this video. <clears throat> no good. And guys, there you have it, your super awesome birdcage turkey foot poker. Now guys, the techniques that we're dealing with are pretty intermediate. Uh, like I said, they're not for a beginner, but they're something you certainly should try. And remember, if you're not good at it, just practice, you'll get better. That's how it works. Uh, these pokers are pretty nice. Normally, uh, back in the day, we'd sell these for $40, $45 because of that basket. The basket takes some time to get used to, but if you have a nice poker with a couple of nice twists in the middle or something like that, it's worth $45. Bucks. So, again, another uh, a little bit more advanced project outside of an S-hook or a hairpin or a <clears throat> railroad spike knife. So, good solid project and, uh, yeah, a good first tool to our set. So, folks, don't forget, we're going to be coming out with uh, three more videos after this one. Again, forgive me if I'm, it's late. The numbers are kind of running together. Uh, we've got our poker. We've got our shovel. We've got our broom and the holder for everything. So it should be an excellent series. Again, guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and sub sub subscribe because it helps. And I need to go inside and have a drink. You guys be good.